in order to produce a dust storm, you need wind and you need soil particles. Come on the road. The dust storm is actually when the visibility is less than a kilometre. About to be engulfed. During the dust storm season, patients get severe attacks of asthma that required hospital admission and intensive care. The dust can be lifted up to three or four miles in altitude before it's really kind of carried away by the winds. Every year, the current estimate is anywhere from two to five billion metric tons. It moves around some distance in the Earth's atmosphere every year. So it's, it's quite a bit of dust. I think the fact that we can see these impacts so far away is really exciting. So in the rainforest, many of the plants derive their nutrients and are fertilized from dust. This plant can reduce the negative effects of dust. So this is the sun and dust storm warning and assessment system for Northern Africa, Middle East, and Europe. It is the number one killer, the number one non-communicable disease that we are trying to tackle today. If it's coming your way, it's a case of, are you going to be suffocated? Holy shit! Oh my god, this is crazy! Wow! Fuck! Uh-oh! About to be engulfed. Oh shit. Oh shit. The Sahara probably produces around about a half, something of that order, of the Earth's dust. And the reason it's there is because there's an old lake that was there when conditions were wetter that's dried up. And it's the material from the floor of that old lake, silt and uh, little silica organisms called diatoms, that get blown away high up into the air and can travel huge distances. There's a range of countries primarily neighbouring the Sahara because this is the major source of sand and dust storms, both to the north and south, but equally to the east, where we're talking of Iraq, Iran, Syria, Kuwait, the Emirates, the Gulf states, Saudi Arabia. But increasingly moving to the east, we run into the Stans, as we call them, Afghanistan, Turkmenistan. And here the difficulty is that they're affected in both directions, sand and dust being driven to the south from the Gobi Desert, from the Tibetan Plateau and all through Asia. So there's a whole range of countries with a long plume starting from the western edge of the Sahara all the way through and up to China. The science behind dust storms is fascinating. We think that 20 to 25% could be attributed to human activity. So something called the Dust Bowl Syndrome, which is associated with poor land management, where the topsoil becomes aerosolized, like tiny, tiny little aerosols, which means that the slightest amount of energy or wind can lift up the soil and effectively take those topsoils many thousands of kilometers. Cloud. Rolling seas of anger move across vast territories and drop that tragic burden of burning dust.
we had a big phenomenon or a tragedy called the Dust Bowl of the United States in the 1930s. How did it happen? Some unusually wet period made people think that water is available and you can plow anywhere you like and, and water would follow and this was the dominant thinking. The Dust Bowl primarily was due to a you know, drop in rainfall in the area. At the same time, the human population was migrating and using that area for agricultural purposes. And they were doing strip farming of the topsoils and then leaving them exposed. And uh, the dust storms got so bad because of that, it drove legislation in 1935 to pass the Soil Conservation Act that Congress passed. And that prohibited that type of farming. A uh, big driver of why the severity of the dust storms dropped over time was because it started raining again. The Americans instituted various things like shelter belts and windbreaks, which really dampened down the dust storm activity in the 1940s and onwards. And that does show that we can do something about it if we wish in the right circumstances. Why don't we get dust storms anytime we have a wind? Because we have a higher soil moisture. So soil moisture acts like a glue. It, it keeps these soil particles um, connected to each other so the wind cannot lift them. As soon as you lose the moisture, you disconnect these particles and these particles um, are blown away easily whenever you have a wind. So when you have a drought, when you have stronger winds, and when you lose your soil moisture, you have a dust storm. We have seen in Middle East and in, in North Africa more and more frequent dust storms and one of the reasons is that water resources uh, in the region have become more scarce. some period after the revolution of 1979 was one of the um, biggest dam builders in, in the war. First, this was advertised as a symbol of power, as a symbol of independence, as a symbol of development. Everyone is proud about doing things like this, but in a short period after this move for building dams, we see a country into a serious water crisis and a lot of issues coming up.
most of this water goes into agriculture. So we want to irrigate and produce food in, in a dry area. So the amount of water we have in the Middle East is enough for, for satisfying our drinking and sanitation needs. It's not enough to produce food with it or make the region self-sufficient in food production. But this is something that the region has not understood well. Now, if you dry your soil, if you use a lot of water and, and waste a lot of water, then you should um, expect a punishment, which is called a dust storm. And that's something we have been punished for in the Middle East uh, because of not using our water properly because of losing soil moisture. Lake Rumia is a, is a good example of a modern um, environmental tragedy that um, was created by humans. We had a salt lake, which was one of the largest in the, in the world. The dominant thinking was that rivers are flowing into the lake, this terminal lake, which has no effect. It, water gets salty. Let's use the water for a good purpose. Let's use it for farming. Let's use it for the urban areas. What happened was that you don't let water go in, um, there is evaporation, the lake got smaller, uh, salt is on its bed, and then when you get wind, the salt is blown, and it becomes a big disaster that the whole region has been affected by, and now a lot of investments should be made in order to restore the lake if that is not only a dream. Sediments are uh, very fine soils, and once they dry out, uh, they're easily mobilized into the atmosphere. And some of the dustiest regions in the planet are usually due to dry lake beds. Good example in the United States. In the early 20th century, the city of Los Angeles tapped Lake Owens as a source for drinking water. And a short time later, that lake was dry, or almost totally dry. And to this day, that is the number one source of dust in the atmosphere in North America. An another example of how much dry lake beds uh, contribute dust to the atmosphere. A great example is Lake Chad in North Africa. And uh, NASA has a great satellite record showing the continual shrinkage of that lake. And the reason it has gone down in size over time is because the source waters have been diverted for agriculture. And that is the prime source in Africa, is that Lake Chad Basin. is one of the worst, in fact, in the region. Most of the uh, uh, trajectories of dust storms are passing through Kuwait. The amount of dust increase, for example, the amount of dust reaches from 2005 to 120 tons per kilometer square. Now it's reached, uh, total 2011, which is uh, 370 tons per kilometer square. So a huge amount of dust has been deposited. They have a great impact on human health. It's very bad for you to breathe in fine silica dust. Uh, it carries allergens, which can, you know, be fungal spores or bacteria, which can affect you and cause hospital admissions or even death.
dust affects all people, irregardless of their genetic predisposition. When you think about the air in Kuwait, uh, the air in Kuwait is full of dust as well as chemicals that come from the oil industry, as well as that comes from pollution from cars. As at the same time, you have a lot of uh, pollen uh, in that air. So if you like, you can say you have a cocktail of, of chemicals into that air. During the dust storm season, the number of patients visiting our clinic increase to double the usual day. And some of them, they get severe attacks that requires hospital admission and intensive care. والله أنا فحصت عند الدكتور وهذا قال لي الأعراض هذه بالجو وهو اللي يأثر علي بالضيق تنفس ما أقدر أتنفس صوتي يطلع صوت أحس بضيق تنفس يعني حاد يعني مو طبيعي هي مو مثل ما تقول موسمية تقول الحساسية موسمية تقول ما يخالف هذا بالموسم أنت لا أنت على طول وياك شغال إذا بدون بدون العلاج ما تقدر لأن عندك ال ال الشعب الهوائية تسكر وياك لازم تأخذ علاج لازم تأخذ علاج عشان تبطل وياك ولا يبطل مسكر وياك إذا ما تستعمل العلاج أنا المرض عندي يزيد من البيئة والجو ويتزايد إذا يعني جاءت نسمات الغبار فيتزايد معي المرض هذا اللي هو برونكاسما أتابع دائما الأرصاد الجوية وخاصة في فترة الصيف والشتاء حتى لا ننسى أن الغبار مؤثر لمرض الربو فأنا لازم أتابع حتى أخرج من البيت إذا حبيت أخرج ما تجيني نوبة الربو فهذه مهمة جدا عندي احنا الحين منطقة سكنية واذا تشوفون البراحل يمنا تحسون كأنكم بصحراء الحين بيتنا فما قدرنا نسوي شيء غير ما نحط الحاجز اللي هنا وهم جربنا نزرع زرع زيادة على الأرض الفاضية اللي هنا عندنا أنواع الشير وأنواع الزرع وهالزرع نقدر يعني حتى عندنا نعناع نستخدمه بالمطبخ بس إن إحنا نستفيد من هالزرع من ناحية الطبخ بس بنفس الوقت نستفيد من من ناحية الغبار علشان إن الزرع قاعد تمسك الغبار أو تثبت الغبار اللي تحت القاع وهم ان الشير قاعد تحمينا شوي من الغبار وقت العاصفه او وقت شيء كذي فاحنا ما نحس فيه كثر ما كثر ما هو صدق موجود بالهواء يعني عندنا نافوره بالبيت وصدق انها هي زينه بس بنفس الوقت الماي يعني يمسك او خلينا نقول انه قاعد يشفط شويه الغبار بس اهم شيء اللي راح تشوفونه بكل بيت كويتي تقريبا الشترات هالشتره اهم شيء بالبيت علشان هالشتر اكثر شيء يقدر يحميكم من الغبار العاصفة الرملية إذا دخلت وضربت المنازل وكذا وحد جاء الغبار نقدر يعني تدخل بأي نسمة هواء تدخل لابد وتدخل وجميع البرونك أزمة يحس فيها nearly 7 million people dying prematurely because of air quality, much of which is a complex mixture of dust that has got pollutants carried with it, means that it is the number one killer, the number one non-communicable disease that we are trying to tackle today.
The size of the particle is very important in causing respiratory uh, problems. 85% of dust size in Kuwait is 10 micrometers, and that's the size that usually causes respiratory complaint and exacerbation of asthma. particles, they interfere with the gas exchange of the lung and result into severe respiratory diseases. What we're looking at now is the dust under a scanning electron microscope. Um, and at the moment we're magnified by 300 times. Uh, so the scale bar on this image is 50 microns across. Um, and so these particles are really, really very small. We have some individual ones, but they also agglomerate all together um, in, in big clumps. So you can see there's a whole different distribution of sizes, some of them very small and some of them a lot larger. Okay, so this is our elemental map of everything that's in the dust. So I'm just going to open it up and we'll have a look at the individual elements. So here's our original sample of dust with a very bright particle here. Um, and that bright particle seems to correspond to some lead, uh, which may be present as a heavy metal in this sample. The other things that we've got present are magnesium, uh, also silicon, aluminium, calcium, and there's a small amount of iron inside of this as well. And you can see that some of these are very well correlated. So for example, the aluminium and the silicon occur in the same location. So this is the diffraction pattern uh, from the dust sample. And what we've been able to identify are four different phases. And these are gypsum, which is calcium sulfate. There's also calcite, which is calcium carbonate. There is quartz, which is probably the main phase that's present in this material. And also a very small amount of a type of mica called muscovite, which is a clay material. Quartz is responsible for upregulation of the inflammatory cells in the respiratory system. Aluminium and magnesium in the dust are responsible for causing mucus irritation in the upper and lower airways. Well, you go out into the desert and you know you, you look at you, you see a lot of dirt in, in topsoil and you and you don't see any growth no trees no brush no anything and you think it's sterile well it's not even in the most inhabitable regions um, if you reach down and you pick between your index finger and your thumb that would be about a uh, gram of topsoil you would have anywhere from 10,000 to a billion bacterial cells Start and lift off. People didn't understand the intensity and how far these storms could move until we had satellite imagery. NASA has over 20 Earth observing satellites that are monitoring constantly different components of the energy and water and carbon cycles. Using satellites, we're able to get a, a global picture 
of the land surface and different components of the land surface. For example, you can monitor the type and amount of vegetation. In addition, you can also tell how wet the uh, soil is uh, by using microwaves. So if you know how wet the surface is, then you have a better idea of, of the intensity and duration and locations of potential dust storms. So this is an animation from a global Earth system model that we run here at NASA. Um, what we're simulating in this are the distributions of what we call aerosols, or particles in the atmosphere. And the different colors represent different kinds of these particles, and they come from all kinds of different sources. So the blue colors are from sea spray that's blown up by the winds at the surface of the sea. The greener colors come from smoke sources, and so there we have individual fires that are going off in the model and emitting smoke into the atmosphere, and it's transported over long distances. The whiter colors correspond to what we would call anthropogenic pollutants, so things that come from power plants or car emissions. Uh, and so you can see places, especially in China or on the east coast of the United States or even in Europe, where a lot of these pollutants are emitted and transported. And then finally, the redder colors that we have correspond to uh, dust storms. And so in that case, what we're looking at is the effect of the surface winds blowing across a region that has a lot of fine particles that can be blown up into the air and blown by the winds over very long distances. So this is, so this is the time series of, of from the MODIS Terra satellite. We are trying to create global observations of aerosol. These are not models. These are based on camera-like images. How it works is satellites measure light reflected from the Earth. And you can see that there's places on the globe where you see lots of aerosol, which is a bright orange color. And you can see the hot spots around the globe. You see the dust in, in Africa, biomass burning in the Amazon. What we don't have from the satellite is exactly what it's made out of. You can get a sense of what kind it is, if it's dust, smoke, pollution. One place that you do see, uh, at least in the 15-year record we have, is there seems to be a, an increase in the Middle East along the, the Arabian Peninsula and in, in that region. And it seems to be a significant increase. Barcelona Supercomputing Center is to provide uh, everyday forecast of sun and dust storms over North Africa, Middle East, and Europe. The dust storm or the dust forecasting uh, is very similar to a weather uh, forecasting, precipitation, but also uh, the wind regimes, right? You know, based on different meteorological scenarios. If you have more wind or less wind, you're going to have more or less dust depending on these anomalies. Basically, what we're producing now are three-day forecasts.
probably, and this is what's going to probably happen in the future, we're going to have probabilistic forecasting. So we're going to have an ensemble of forecasts with different additional conditions at very high resolution and we will be able to provide a probabilistic forecast as this is happening now for weather forecasting for precipitation. For example, you have seen that uh, we have a 30% chance of precipitation in this area or a 70% chance. So that, that's the idea also with uh, dust storms in the future, particularly these uh, storms that are really um, very difficult to, to capture, which are the, the finer scale, but that can be particularly intense. In fact, our dust forecast requires even more computing time than a weather forecast would, would require. Uh, it's only by having a machine like the one we have behind us that we can afford performing the best dust forecasts. And uh, not only the dust forecasts themselves, but the archiving and the management of the uh, data that is pr being produced, which is in the order of gigabytes uh, of, of data every single day. Of course, the other thing that we need to bring in is more data that comes from the ground that will help us refine things like the maps that we use for our dust sources um, and even have them evolving over time by including some information about vegetation and economics and how that will influence things like dust sources. that we have in our region is the conflicts, the instability, and the ongoing violence and terrorism. And that is aggravating the situation. Unfortunately, a lot of the tracked vehicles and the driving over the desert surface by the combatants has disturbed the desert surface and made it worse. Uh, the effect of war activities, especially in Iraq and Syria, caused a huge amount of vegetation to have been destroyed. I'm talking about native vegetation, which make new sources of dust, never there in the past. If we have a dust storm generated in a place like Syria and Iraq, it is very different from a dust storm which is generated from a place like Oman or UAE because in places like Iraq and Syria we have had conflicts for years so we have toxic elements which could be attached to the surface. Dust moves many thousands of kilometers and in moving picks up all kinds of what we would call legacy chemicals. It could be depleted uranium, it could be pesticides, it could be hazardous chemicals, heavy metals, contaminants. And the dust itself becomes like a small nucleus. It attracts and sticks together and brings pollutants together. So as those big areas of dust get lifted and moved, they become part of the ambient air quality problems that many cities have. Many farmers abandoned the lands, uh, particularly in Syria, and, uh, and the, those farmers went to the cities. Uh, so there's a lot of land abandonment as well. This creates wind erosion in what we had before as agricultural fields. These are now exposed to wind erosion. Syria wasn't before a source area. Now it's a huge area of dust. Also, the area between Zagros Mountains and, uh, and Tigris River, we found a huge amount of, because this was affected by war activities, multiple war activities. So drained farms and uh, abundant farms became a huge source of dust, in fact, from this region. 
Once the land is, is dried up, any, any sort of wind, any strong wind in, in dry times can blow the dust particles. So people in Khuzestan now have one third of their days a year um, dusty and, and you know living in those areas is, is not pleasant anymore. The marshlands in southern Iraq are adversely affecting our western, southwestern cities like Ahwaz. And part of it is also coming from neighboring countries and part coming from the hotspots that we have inside the country, the areas which are prone to soil erosion. We've been witnessing a steady increase in the number of incidences, but also in the intensity of dust storms, maybe in the past two decades. And so it's not only affecting our border cities, but now sometimes the dust storms are moving ahead into the capital, Tehran. This is the Liyah area. Uh, it was a quarry area in the past in Kuwait. The quarrying is prohibited in Kuwait in 2003. Uh, so all the quarries was dumped and zero vegetation was in this area before. Now the area is rehabilitated again by using native plants uh, in order to form a very good uh, native life in the region. We planted about 110,000 native plants in the area means native plants captured huge amount of dust and sand around the, the plant. It wasn't there before. So this kind of, of sediments is formed by the dust and sand transported by wind. It contains a lot of nutrients. It reaches up to 9% of organic matter inside it. This plant, for example, we see it, uh, its common name is called al -Qurdi. It's a very good one, in fact, in capturing the sand. Uh, another plant, in fact, we see it here. This one is another plant called Lysium shawi. This, this Aeolian sediments, it wasn't there before. So this plant captured that amount of sand and Aeolian, Aeolian dust and uh, can reduce the effect, the negative effect of dust. Native plants is a major solution, in fact. Let's give an example, Halicinal salicornicum as a plant. It can control up to 10 cubic meters of sand and dust. This is a single plant. What if it's thousands of plants? If you understand how much water's in the land surface, uh, that can really help you forecasting and monitoring droughts and floods. What we're seeing here, the red and yellow colors represent precipitation, and the orange and blue colors are the changes in soil moisture from the average. 
blue colors represent wetter areas and red colors represent drier areas. So if you have a direct observation of the amount of moisture in the land surface and you can improve your understanding of the amount of moisture in the root zone, that's a very, very important variable for uh, improving your understanding of crops. It provides a map with details of dust concentration in the Middle East and North Africa. If we zoom in, around Syria and southern part of Iran. We see a high concentration of dust. Uh, the yellow color shows higher concentration. The dark brown is very high concentration of dust, which is beyond, well beyond WHO limits. So you will see what happens every hour in next 72 hours. There's some very positive impacts from dust storms blowing around the planet. Many of the soils in the Caribbean islands, um, the clays came from North Africa, and it enabled the pre-Columbian Indians to build clay pottery. And without that dust blowing across and building out in the soils, the, the clay wouldn't be in the Caribbean. You, you wouldn't find it. Some of the rainforest from North Africa, the dust blows over. It goes into South America during the nor uh, Northern Hemisphere's winter. It moves down in there. And many of the plants derive their nutrients and are fertilized from dust. And, and the same with Asian dust blowing across fertilizes some of the Northern Hawaiian Island rainforests and sustains them. So there's some very positive things. The dust that we see in South Florida is from the Saharan region, and really July and August is the peak time when we tend to see dust events. Um, typically, it'll look like a hazy day, and to somebody who doesn't know that there's dust in the air or isn't thinking about it, they'll just say, it's a hazy day. Um, but, but you can tell, and if you're collecting aerosol samples on filters, you can actually see that your filters start turning orange during dust events. The economy of the Florida Keys is almost entirely based on having a healthy coral reef, whether it's because um, commercial or, or recreational fishers are going out to the reef and that's where the, the fish stocks are, or because of diving and having a picturesque place to be in the water. Um, we've seen a, a very large decline in the corals over the last 20 years. They're not particularly good state right now. The dust might be involved in the deterioration, at least it's a hypothesis that we have. So we collect a variety of water samples. We collect samples from just below the surface, um, usually just grab samples in bottles, and then we'll process them in a variety of ways. We'll filter them, so we'll take larger volumes and filter them down into small, usable volumes that we can concentrate to look for nutrients or trace metals or, or microbes. Well, we're looking for a number of things. So we're looking at changes in water chemistry. As the dust is deposited, we're looking at changes in the amount of trace metals that are there, especially iron, which is very limiting in marine waters, and there's a lot of organisms that require iron to grow.
I grew up in South Florida, and it was quite common in news reports for the, you know, the weather forecast to say, oh, there's Saharan dust, and it's going to be beautiful sunsets. That was my image of Saharan dust. And so I think there, there may be a particular draw. It's a unique aspect that, you know, people don't necessarily think of here, and it makes for, you know, very picturesque views when you're on the water. Close the door. You know, we're very good in developing technologies, launching satellites and, and doing things, but when it comes to policies, many times we, we act stupidly, we, we become stupid, we don't understand the realities on the ground or we don't care about the long-term consequences of our policies. Very, very clearly, desertification is something that we need to tackle at a very local level. And it's mundane things, planting trees, using proper irrigation, making sure that we have a vegetative cover that avoids the aerosolization of the topsoil. Of course, dust is a natural phenomenon. It's always going to be there. We're going to have the natural desert. It's going to blow up dust. It's going to transport this dust over different regions. But we can do a lot with land conservation practices. They still have some dust storms in the US but not of that size because they have better land management practices. The same has to happen in the Middle East. This is a multinational uh, problem and it needs a multinational solution. So countries in the region have to come together and solve this problem.